Um, morning, everybody. Today's the fifth of our Marine Science in the Morning um, presentations. Uh, today we have Ken Joelli from the Nat. He's the Natural Resources Extension Agent from uh, or for the UF IFAS Extension in St. Louis, St. Lucie County. Uh, he's got 31 years of experience teaching Florida residents about native and non-native plants and animals. Recently, he's published work on Peter's Rock, Agama, and Brown Basilisks through the UF EDIS online journal. Ken has an, a master's in ag in ag, an MAG in agricultural education and communication from UF and a certificate in environmental education and communication also from UF. Uh, he's also a graduate of the Organization for Tropical Studies, Tropical Biodiversity Short Course in Costa Rica, where he studied vampire bats in their native habitat. Um, he's also a native, or I mean, a Fort Pierce son, right? Central High School. Is that right? Yeah, Fort Pierce Central High School. Yep. Class, oh, let's just say that the class was in the 80s. I'm yeah. dating myself, but same, I've earned all these gray hairs. Yeah, same. Mine was uh, 80s also. Um, and finally, Ken is a lead instructor for the UF IFAS Florida Master Naturalist Program, which teaches Floridians about plants, animals, and human dimensions of Florida upland, freshwater, and coastal systems. That's kind of a neat program. I uh, have contemplated doing that myself. Um, but without further ado, Ken, if you want to say anything or if you want to start sharing your screen, we'll. Well, uh, as always, I appreciate the opportunity to work with the. Um... St. Lucie County Aquarium. I'm going to share my presentation screen now. So for the next few minutes, we will be talking about non-native reptiles. And hopefully you are seeing, it doesn't look like you're seeing. Uh, let me stop share for a minute here. Go in presentation mode again. While you're getting that figured out, I'll just remind people that we will be taking questions in the Q&A um, sort of chat session. And uh, Dr. Paul is here to help answer anything she can. Anything that we can't cover, we will um, ask Ken at the end. Very good, thank you. So my presentation today is non-native reptiles on the Treasure Coast. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak this morning about these issues. So a little bit of nuance in some of the wording that I'm gonna use in my presentation. When I use the word non-native, that basically means that the reptile came from someplace outside of Florida, probably outside of the United States. And um, when I use the word invasive, that takes it the next step. So not only does it come from somewhere outside of Florida and probably the US, but we have to show a degree of significant harm. So you'll be noticing that I'm using words and in one sense, I might be saying something is non-native and another sense, I'll be saying something is invasive. And when I use that word invasive, that means that significant enough harm has been shown that the majority of the specialists that work with wildlife uh, would all agree that there's significant harm enough to call it invasive. So that's, that's some of the nuances in the language and wording I'll be using. So this is my contact information. Uh, Amanda Thompson with the Nature Conservancy, uh, myself and Rent Underwood, uh, we are part of the Python Patrol. We were trained to do this. And in this particular photo, Amanda took a picture of me wrangling a rock python uh, during our training session. That rock python was very ornery. So basically what they do is they, they bring us in, they do training with us, and then uh, they've got reptiles that they release in a very contained area and it's up to us to go and catch them again. So in this particular case, I, I caught that rock python and don't worry, it was not gonna get away. There were enough people there that if I didn't get it right, somebody else would have. So as always, I appreciate the opportunity to work with the aquarium, David Br um, Branson, uh, Valerie Paul, uh, and then Bill Hoffman. And I also wanna give some uh, a shout out, some kudos to my colleagues at the UF Croc Docs, especially Paul Evans. Uh, he is the person that I tend to go to when these uh, new reptile issues tend to pop up. And then we also have Dr. Steve Johnson at the University of Florida in the main campus that is another person I also work with quite heavily on non-native and invasive reptile issues. 
So thank you to all those folks for the support over the years. Uh, so who are we? The University of Florida IFAS, and that's the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Uh, we are an extension service of the University of Florida. All 67 counties in the state of Florida have an extension program, at least one extension program. Most of them are run through the University of Florida. There are some Florida A&M partners um, that are also extension programs scattered around the state. And then we also have 13 research centers that are doing research in the field that we have the ability to tap into. So locally, we have people working in commercial horticulture, 4-H, fruit and alternative crops, community resource development, urban horticulture, myself and natural resources in the environment. And then we have Dr. Vincent Encomio in Sea Grant. And then we have two offices, one in Port St. Lucie by the Morningside Branch Library. And then our main campus is um, off of Kings Highway. I used to be able to tell people we were across the street from the old High Life Fronton, but they recently tore that down. So I'm going to have to find a new landmark now to, to let people know where we are. But we're off of Kings Highway, west of Fort Pierce, near the Turnpike. So my objectives this morning, I'm going to be telling you what's up with these non-native reptiles, uh, talk about some of the introduced reptile species and how to identify them, what the impacts might be. Uh, some of the impacts we don't know, but we're continuing to learn about them. And then resource monitoring and how you can report these non-natives using some geomatics uh, applications. So using your chat, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what people think. There is a chat function in this webinar, and I believe everybody should have the ability to put words in chat, not less for whatever reason it's, it's not visible. Uh, it's not blocked, it's available. Okay, so I would like to, to know what, what one or two words come to mind when you see this picture of this, um, this particular boa that was caught in St. Lucie County in October, 2022. Does anybody wanna include one or two words in the chat? Oh, David, heck no. Well, heck yeah, they're here. Unfortunately, they're here. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll kind of leave that there and people can include some words um, when they, when they get around to it. So snakes and lizards, we have 46 native species of snakes in the state of Florida. Six of them are venomous and potentially dangerous to people. Uh, the ones that are venomous in our area, of course, we've got two rattlesnakes. That's the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake and the um, Dusky Pygmy rattlesnake. The coral snake is another one we have to be concerned with. And then um, the water moccasin, also called the cottonmouth. Those tend to be four of the six venomous species that could potentially be dangerous to people that could be found in our area. And then with the lizards, uh, we have 15 that are considered to be native. As of May 16th, 2022, and I guess I should update this because we're almost a year from that last update, we had approximately 156 exotic reptile species reported in this statewide reported database called EDMAPS. 16 exotic amphibians were also included in there. And EDMAPS is uh, a website that I do recommend uh, that people become familiar with if you're concerned about non-native reptiles. Uh, people do a really good job of reporting to that, and that's the one that I tend to go to quite a bit. Why are non-native reptiles a problem? Well, in South Florida, we have a subtropical climate, uh, heavy port activity, and then we have reptile dealers. So uh, a lot of people are still out there able to go and buy some of these non-native reptiles that we see crawling around Florida. Uh, they're still able to buy some of them in pet stores. Uh, some of them are banned though. Some of them, however, like the pythons, they are not able to buy those anymore. The numbers of introduced and established species are increasing, and there are more non-native lizards breeding in Florida than native. Most of what you're seeing out there in terms of lizards, uh, they are non-natives. The, the Cuban um, the Cuban brown anole, for example, is the most commonly seen one. That one, of course, is non-native non to Florida. So South Florida has less than a 50% chance of experiencing freezing temperatures. And up here in St. Lucie County, we have about a 60% chance of having freezing temperatures. Many tropical reptiles and amphibian species can survive here year round. 
even if we have that occasional cold snap, uh, many of them are able to kind of dig in and, and bear through that, you know, one or two days of cold when we might actually get a frost on the ground. So how are these reptiles getting here? What are the invasion pathways? And research done by Chrysco and colleagues has shown that by far the pet trade is the way that they're coming in. And we had 125 introductions uh, through the pet trade. And that's followed by cargo stowaways. Um, every once in a while, we hear about a Cuban tree frog that's hopped on a car and has been found up in Chicago or something. Well, don't worry, it's not gonna sustain itself up there. Uh, but that's how they were carried in. It could have been carried in on a boat, for all we know. And then some zoo escapes, and then biological control, which is um, only accounting for two. And that is through uh, research that has concluded these pathways. So this is an interesting graphic. I received this from Frank Mazzotti with the UF Croc Docs, but I don't believe he's the originator of this. And I, I need to find the source of this. Um, because I'm using it quite a bit in my presentations. So basically, this is the paradigm of how something becomes an invasive species. Well, first of all, we want to prevent them from getting here in the first place. That's why we have government agencies that have restrictions on what can be brought into Florida at our ports. Uh, we have the Florida Department of Agriculture, Division of Plant Industry, that will be inspecting some shipments and plants and so forth to make sure that non-native insects that could potentially be a problem, you know, they get stopped at the ports. Uh, so preventing them is very important. However, it is not a foolproof way of keeping them out. Every once in a while, there are cracks in this system. And when a small number of localized populations get a toehold in Florida, uh, it might potentially be possible to eradicate that quick introduction. That's why early detection and rapid response is really important when we're talking about non-native and potentially invasive reptile species and any invasive actually, um, early detection, rapid response. But let's say that you have rapid increase in distribution and abundance. Uh, at that point, eradication is not likely. Uh, in other words, the population has expanded very quickly and has just you know, burgeoned over. And at that point, by the time the public typically becomes aware of them, uh, containment is probably the only thing that we're gonna be able to achieve. Complete eradication is not likely. Uh, for example, in our area, you know, 10 years ago, we did not see those redheaded uh, Peters's Rakagama. We, we never saw those 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and then when we did start seeing them, they were constrained down in Martin County. But over the last 10 or 15 years, they made their way over the Roosevelt Bridge and they're working their way all the way up the coast of Florida. So, you know, the public is aware of it. And at this point, it's too late to do a complete eradication. It's basically, we're trying to contain the problem and it's not easy to do that. And then once the invasive species has spread wide enough and there's enough abundance, uh, long-term management is needed and uh, to suppress the population of non-native reptiles. And what comes to mind with this are the issues with the pythons and the Everglades. So you may be having some of these pythons that are impacting wildlife populations uh, in the Everglades. At that point, you're having to take make decisions. You know, how are we going to manage land on species on such a large amount of acreage um, when we have such a large problem with these non-native reptiles, especially Burmese pythons, which are notoriously difficult to find. So, you know, you have to have strategies to figure out how you're going to keep the desirable wildlife and the desirable um, state of the ecosystem intact. So I'd like to start talking about some of the reptiles that we've seen recently. Uh, the Peter's Rakagama is probably the one that people talk about the most. And the male is the one that has the red head and it becomes even more pronounced as it becomes more uh, reproductively active. So as it's ready to reproduce, the coloration gets a little bit redder, the, the indigo parts become a little bit deeper blue and they become really showy at that point. And usually the male, especially the alpha male will usually have a harem of 
several females. And the females look almost like a brown Cuban anole. However, uh, they're a little bit larger. They do not have the red head that the males have, but they have a little bit of turquoise in their coloration. So these reptiles are native to East Africa. They were first introduced in 1976 in the pet trade. And they were probably introduced several times, and that's what Nunez has discovered through his research. DNA analysis showed that it's not closely related to Agama Agama Africana, which is the red-headed Agama, also called the rainbow Agama. When I first started doing uh, outreach on non-native reptiles, uh, especially when people were asking me about these red-headed Agama, uh, that's what I used to call them. That's what the research at that time had pointed me in the direction of Agama Agama Africana, the red-headed Agama. However, Nunez did DNA analysis. Uh, he tried getting me involved in this. I just didn't have the time to go out and, and collect the Agama that he needed. Um, but he did research that showed that it is not what we originally thought. So some of the older publications, you might see news stories. Um, if you search under my last name, you might be able to find news clips of me calling them red-headed Agama or African rainbow Agama. The research has shown that that's not what they actually are. So I've had to change my, my discussion about this. Um, the same reptile dealers in Homestead, Miami-Dade, and Palm City in Martin County were responsible for multiple releases. So um, yeah. So the current range in Florida, you can see that we are in the prime territory for Peter's Rock Agama in Florida. And they're working their way around Lake Okeechobee, uh, heading up to Orlando, and they're working their way over to the Tampa Bay area. Uh, I would not be surprised if we don't see them going all the way up to Daytona Beach and, um, and even further. So what we need people to start doing is using these geomatic applications, and I'll talk about them a little bit later on, and start reporting these, these non-native reptiles so we can keep this map current and dynamic. So this was as of 2020. Well, three years later, this, this map has probably um, shown an expanded range if we were to do a revision, which we probably will be in another year or two. So what do they eat? These Peter's Rockagama are mostly carnivores. Uh, they will eat some fruit uh, in their native range in East Africa. They are mostly insectivorous, but they've also been observed eating small mammals, birds, small reptiles, and vegetation such as flower, grasses, and fruit. However, more study is needed on the diet in Florida. Reproduction. In Florida, it's spring and summer. Uh, sometime during um, April through August, the female will lay clutches of eggs that are seven to eight, seven to nine eggs, and then she may lay two to three clutches annually. I personally have never seen the eggs out in the wild. I've had people send me photos of what we suspect might have been Agama eggs. However, it's unless you hatch them out, sometimes it's very difficult to make that determination. Um, so I personally am still working on becoming familiar with um, the reproductive cycles of these reptiles and what the eggs look like in the nest nesting situation, the clutch size. So I had a very innovative intern last summer. Uh, his name is Sean, and his goal was to develop an agama trap. He actually had several goals. Um, one of them was to develop an agama trap. And this trap is a live cage trap that was successful. And basically what it is, it's a, a bait fish trap, a minnow trap. And what he did is he sealed up all the openings. And then we put a cricket trap in the middle of it. We filled up the crickets with, uh, filled up that, that trap with crickets. And we put it out in areas where the Agama were able to see this trap with all the crickets in it. Uh, Sean did a really good job observing from a distance, and he would get the binoculars out, and he would just watch them. Uh, he really did a great job on this project. And what he was noticing is that the, the Agama, usually a male Agama, would come up and approach first, and they just weren't smart enough. They knew that the crickets were in there, that they wanted to eat them, but they weren't smart enough to figure out how to get into the trap. So you see that palm frond that Sean had uh, in the lower corner. He tried making ramps and things like that to help figure, you know, to help the agama figure out how to get in the traps. And 
you know, we contemplated what to do. And I went out in the field with them one time and I, I saw what it was that was actually occurring. And I said, well, why don't we actually just cut a hole in the bottom? And when we cut the hole in the bottom, sure enough, within five minutes, we had caught our first agama. So in this next slide, there's a video and hopefully it will show up well. They just, oh, let me share my screen again here. Give me a second as I work on this. I love, I love PowerPoints and stuff when they're embedded in, in Zoom, especially if there's a video. So give me a second while I get past the slide. Okay. All right. So Sean did a really great job spending quite a bit of time. And what you noticed in that video is uh, the agama were probing underneath. So we felt, well, if they're probing underneath, why not just make it easy for them? Let's not do any ramps or anything like that. Just close up the openings and just put a hole in the bottom and the agama were going right in. And um, he did a really great job at figuring that out. Um, another reptile that we've been working on quite a bit lately are the brown basilisks. And uh, one of our uh, staff members here at the extension office uh, asked me about the basilisks because she was seeing them in her backyard off of Krauss Towns Parkway in Port St. Lucie. And she had mentioned that she wasn't really finding much information about them in terms of what's going on in Florida. So we wrote a publication on it. We did a lot of research and uh, did an EDIS publication for UF and uh, it's available now. We have it in both English and Spanish. And if you contact me, I'd be happy to get the information to you. Uh, they were first introduced in Florida in 1976. First year in St. Lucie County was 2003. Uh, the origin it ranges from central Mexico to Northern Colombia. Uh, populations are confirmed in breeding, apparently self-sustaining 10 or more consecutive years. So they are expanding in population sizes and they're found in ditches, canals, uh, very commonly called the Jesus Christ lizard. So the first time I encountered them was in the canal ways uh, over by the Oxbow Eco Center off of St. James in Port St. Lucie. I was actually on site looking for some other reptiles. And when I went towards the canal, all of a sudden I heard and saw splashes of water and rustling in the saw palmettos that were nearby. And it reminded me quite a bit of uh, the velociraptors in the Jurassic Park movies, except in miniature. So, you know, these reptiles, they get to be at the most, maybe 10 inches to a foot in length. Uh, they seem to be getting larger and larger though, as time goes on. But, you know, that's very reminiscent. It reminded me very much of those Jurassic Park movies. Uh, they're known from the crest on the top of their heads, and uh, they have a lateral line that goes down the sides of their bodies. When they're near water and they're trying to escape from predators or from me, uh, what they have the ability to do is run on water so they can go fast enough and put enough downward pressure on their back legs that they kind of get up on their hind legs and then run and scamper across the water and all you see are splashes of water flying everywhere. And um, so that's why they call it the Jesus Christ lizard uh, because it can literally walk, in this case, run on water. Of course, another one that is confirmed to be invasive is the green iguana. Uh, green iguana can be either brown or green. There is a brown spiny tailed iguana, 
But the one that we're seeing in St. Lucie County uh, is the green iguana and it comes in a brown or green color form. This particular photo I took off uh, Savannah's, off of Midway Road, the Savannah's Recreation Area. And just a month ago, we had our um, bicycle iguanathon uh, over at the Savannah's. We didn't know, you know, if we were going to be successful or not. We did see iguana out there, uh, but we had 35 people on bicycles riding the, the two-mile trail down there that's paved. And sure enough, uh, we did see iguana on the way back and they were basking on some branches. Uh, they're first reported in the 1960s in Hialeah, Coral Gables, and Key Biscayne. Uh, right now, they're in Broward, Martin, St. Lucie, Miami-Dade, um, and then on the West Coast as well. The reason they're considered to be invasive is because of the fact that they're known to, uh, well, first of all, the expanding range, but also the fact that they have the ability to um, drop salmonella onto uh, crops. So let's say these vegetarians, by the way, they are vegetarian. Let's say you have strawberries or cucumbers or something that are growing in a field. Well, that's very desirable to iguanas. And they would go in there and they would eat those particular fruits and vegetables. Well, as they're doing that, the potential is there for them to pass salmonella in their droppings. So that's how we were able to consider them invasive because there is potentially harm to to people. I'm going to back up one slide because I forgot to mention something with basilisks. We're calling them non-native right now, but there is research that is starting to come out from the Florida Medical Entomology Lab that this, this particular species and some of these smaller reptiles, and I'm assuming the agama might, might fit in there, they are known to be bitten by some of these Culex mosquitoes that could potentially be passing some pretty nasty zoonotic viruses to people. So we know, for example, Eastern equine encephalitis, it goes from a Culex mosquito to a bird where the viruses are amplified in a bird. And then another mosquito bites the bird and gets the, the virus in them and then goes and bites a person. And that's generally how people get these diseases. Um, so there's research right now looking to see if these reptiles dilute or amplify viral loads for these, these nasty viruses. And that work is being done at the Florida Medical Entomology Lab in Vero Beach. But I cannot tell you right now that there's conclusive um, evidence that they are invasive, but, but there certainly is, um, there are people looking into it. So one other non-native is the Brahmini blind snake. Every once in a while, I have somebody coming into the extension office telling me that they found a worm in their bathtub. And usually they're not worms, it's the Brahimini blind snake. And they're small, about less than six inches, round. Um, they do have scales if you look at it under the microscope. And you see in that bottom picture, there are scales on it. Uh, they were first introduced in 1976. There's cargo stowaways. These are fossorial, which in other words, they're gonna be digging themselves down into some soil. Uh, if you have mulch, they might be digging themselves down into the mulch. And um, they're parthenogenic. In other words, they're all females. Uh, they're widely introduced globally, um, strictly fossorial and found under rocks, logs, debris. Um, they eat eggs and pupae of ants and termites. So there might actually be a little bit of a benefit to having them there. Uh, when people find them in their bathtubs, um, usually what's going on is somebody has brought a plant into the bathroom and one of these Brahimini blind snakes has been in the plant, um, in the pot, and has worked their way down into the bathtub. And there's only one way to get out, and that's down the um, uh, down the downspout there. Uh, they're not able to get out with down the drain. They're not able to get out unless they either go down the drain or somebody picks them up and moves them out of the bathtub. It's basically a giant pitfall. And you see the size of it. They're really tiny. And we have uh, worked with Burmese pythons. Uh, we have had reports of them here in St. Lucie County. They are in the Everglades. South Florida is uh, the primary invasion location for these reptile species. Um, this particular photo was part of the python patrol training that we went through. And um, it was quite an experience, let me tell you. FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife, prohibits snakes and lizards. They have a law that says, um, iguana and tag use, 
Um, they can be qualifying only for commercial sale use um, and so forth. Uh, there are limitations um, basically for many of these non-natives. Uh, and you cannot use these, you cannot have these reptiles. Um, you can't purchase new ones unless you're within a very narrowly defined um, reason for having them. These Burmese pythons, reticulated pythons, green anaconda, and so forth. So these are pretty much prohibitive right now. If you currently have one and it's been chipped, then of course you can keep it until it dies. Um, but more than likely, you're not going to be able to buy another one from a pet store um, unless you have some specific reasons for needing it. Burmese pythons, they can be as large as 16 feet. Um, they have somewhat of a giraffe style skin coloration. Their patterns look giraffe style. They are huge. Uh, introduced in 1979 in the pet trade. And their range is primarily in South Florida. However, they are expanding northward. Here in St. Lucie County, we've had a few reports of them. Uh, usually 911 takes those calls when they come in. Um, they're able to eat native species such as deer, alligators, and so forth. Uh, they are considered to be invasive. They're one of the worst of the worst. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, the laws are there for a reason. And these are all the introductions. This was pulled up on Ed Maps, and you see. Um, down in the Everglades, just west of Kendall and Miami, uh, 2,210 uh, 2, reported sightings up there. In Port St. Lucie, there have been four. Um, the, these green areas are, are where we were seeing them um, reported in May 16th, 2022. So this map, once again, needs to be updated. So potentially, the spread is going northward. Uh, if they go much further north outside of Florida, it may be more difficult for them to sustain themselves. Uh, they may have to, during the wintertime, bury themselves down into mulch piles or find refugia uh, where they can survive the cold temperatures. Uh, but they are certainly um, widespread throughout central, uh, mostly South Florida, though. They're very often reported to the police or, or sheriff. Uh, they will sometimes make it into the newspaper, um, but they're not always reported in a way that scientists and biologists uh, can, can use the information. Uh, for example, this 12-foot Burmese python with an appetite for cats was reported um, on a lot uh, in Port St. Lucie, and this was reported in T.C. Palm in 2014, and um, the police department were, was dispatched and they took care of it. Uh, what happened is these pythons, they're using the canalways. Basically, they're aquatic organisms. They will get around in the canal systems, these freshwater systems, they will sometimes be in saltwater areas, but usually just to get to someplace else. And then, of course, they're able to climb through trees and, and be fairly um, dynamic in the environment as far as where they go. So what is UF IFAS doing in St. Lucie County? We have master naturalist training. Some of my students, they've taken the coursework and they've actually gone out and become members of the Python Patrol and they've become certified. Uh, we do resource monitoring, we do public outreach like this, and then of course program evaluation to find out how well we're, we're doing um, with teaching people how to um, identify and monitor and, and manage these reptiles. So how can you help? You can be eyes and ears. Uh, as you're out and about, everybody for the most part has cell phones now, and there is software out there that can help us figure this out where they are, um, where these reptiles are. There's um, EdMaps, for example, I've referenced that several times. The app that feeds into EdMaps is called I've Got One. And when you're out and about, if you see a non-native reptile, first of all, make sure you're safe because there are some of these reptiles could potentially be dangerous, especially these Burmese pythons could be um, capable of killing a person. So um, make sure that you yourself are safe and then use that app to take some photos and upload it to the system. And people on the other side of I've Got One, they're usually monitoring Ed Maps. Uh, they're able to uh, do a verification. And if it's soon enough, uh, we might be able to do um, an early detection rapid response and get out there and actually do an eradication. Um, 
We cannot go out for every agama. We cannot go out for every Cuban tree frog. Uh, but certainly, if there's something large and unusual, uh, we will try to make all accommodations to get out there and work with, with the situation. We also have information on snakes that are native in, in Florida, and that's through the UF Bookstore and through our EDIS uh, series of publications. And special thanks to these experts, Dr. Steve Johnson, Dr. Frank Mazzotti, and then um, Paul Evans. So what I'd like to do at this point is put a quick survey in the chat box. And I need you to do a favor for me, please. And in the chat box, there is a survey. Just click on that link and let me know what you thought about the presentation today. And, um, and while you're doing that, maybe you can put some questions in the chat box. And uh, David, I can go ahead and take questions if, if there's anybody that has questions. Thanks, Ken. Um, it looks like... Emma's telling me that the chat's disabled, so I'm going to put this in the Q&A. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if everybody can see the... Uh, I'll put it in answered. Oh, I guess not. Okay, so answer... V. Oh, that's not it. Hang on. V. I know how to compute. V. Okay. So I put the link into the Q&A under an answered question where Emma Chesley is telling me that chat is disabled. So if you can go in there. I can't see Other, it. Um, otherwise, I will send it around um, via email. Oh, Kelly said she has. I'm not sure if everybody can see it. There's, we've had some issues with chat and Q. &A. Oh, I see. I I put it down to um, hosts and panelists. panelists. Okay, okay. Kelly sent it to everybody. everybody. All right, thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, if so, anybody's got anything, please put it in the Q and A or pipe up if you have the ability. Um. I guess I, I have a I do have a question and sure. um, I have I for well one statement too I've been calling those agamas redheaded agamas so now I'll have to correct my Peter's Peter's rock agama I'll now remember it not the same ring but I'll use it um, do uh, do you are are there any any of the species that we talked about are they are any of them such that they want civilians um, to exterminate them, like on site, or um, is it always, you know, call somebody? Um, pretty much any of the ones we talked about today, uh, lethal, humane, lethal um, euthanization would be recommended. Mm -hmm. And I am not the person who is the regulator who determines what is and what is not humane. And I'm a little bit hesitant, as always, to talk about euthanization, but I will, um, since we're, you know, working on uh, the aquarium is a scientific organization. I work for a scientific organization, and sometimes these things have to be discussed. So, the Fish and Wildlife considered humane euthanization to be um, destruction of the brain. So you can use. Uh, a pellet gun, uh, something that's going to be uh, usually a single impact blow to the skull, destroy the brain, and then they want you to take it a second step, and they want you to get a screwdriver or something like that and pith out the brain matter. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much a two-step process. And this goes through, you know, it, it works for Burmese pythons as, as well as these Peter's rock agama. Um, they want the same process used where you're um, impacting the skull, you know, destroying the brain um, as expeditiously as possible, and then pithing the, the brain matter out. They consider that to be uh, humane. And, but they also know that these reptiles, these non-natives and the invasives, 
it's beyond the ability in many cases for us to do anything other than containment. So you could spend your whole life out there trying to kill off every Peter's Rockagama that you see in St. Lucie County. You're not going to get them all. They're here to stay. However, if you have some in your backyard, well, you might be able to work at it. It's not going to be the easiest thing in the world for you to do. But if you have nothing else going on, you know, knock yourself out. Um, so I, I hope that answered the question for it. They, they, once you trap them, they do not want them released alive. Mm -hmm. I, I know just on our, in our little compound here, we've got iguanas and uh, Peter's Rockagamas. So, yeah. So, you know, just, you know, that, so that, that two-step process mm -hmm. and um, you guys are in the aquarium trade. So you probably have those uh, fish bait traps around and they work really well. Um, beta with crickets, they work really well at capturing those, those agama out there. So um, Valerie has a question. Can you comment on the diets of agama and other lizards? Um, do they eat insects or other lizards? So what we're finding with some of them is uh, like the iguana, for example, they're going to be eating fruits and vegetables. They're, they're going to be um, um, vegetarians. However, the Agama and the basilisks are going to be a little bit more omnivorous. They're primarily carnivores. They will be eating other smaller reptiles. Uh, they will eat some fruits and vegetables, but they're usually looking for, you know, uh, smaller things that are out crawling around, insects and smaller reptiles. Um, we have seen some study where some of the native green anoles have been pushed higher up into tree canopies. They've been displaced. And that's all because of uh, competition. Uh, these non-native reptiles are pushing the native green anoles um, out of their natural territory and, and causing them a little more distress, causing them to, to move to other parts of their environment. So they're out there, they're doing harm to the environment, but you know, we still don't know exactly the extent of all of it. Okay, I don't see anything else coming in, at least to the main Q and A. Um, so at this point, I guess I'd like to say thank you for uh, coming thank to you. talk to us. It's very, it's nice to hear something that's not specifically marine oriented sometimes and. Uh, and these are things that we see all around us. And uh, yeah, that's it, pretty interesting. So um, do you have anything to say about that naturalist program in terms of uh, if people want to attend that or take that? Sure. I have that uh, process? Right, right now I'm teaching the Florida Master Naturalist Environmental Interpretation class. And the first day of class was on Tuesday, uh, but it was our first day orientation. If anybody wants to take that course, they would go to Master Naturalist ifis.ufl.edu and I can put that in the chat box and hopefully I will get that. Yeah, I put it in the chat box and this time I addressed it to everybody. That's my, my fault, you know. Um, but starting in April, I'm going to be doing the coastal shoreline restoration course with Dr. Vincent and Comio. And some of your viewers, especially if they're marine oriented, um, may have an interest in that particular course uh, because we will be talking about um, mangrove restoration, oyster bed restoration, and some others. Uh, what we don't get into is seagrass restoration and we don't get into sponge or coral restoration. That is for the marine habitat course that I am not, I, I don't plan on teaching that. Um, the thing about these courses, you, we have to take field trips. And with that marine habitat course, we would do really well with the seagrass restoration field trip locally. But if I was going to take somebody out to teach them about coral restoration, I would want to go down to the Keys right. to do that. If I want to talk about sponge restoration, I would want to go to Tampa or someplace over in that area. Although we do have some native sponges and non-native sponges that, that live around here. Um, so we try to work within the constraints of a budget. It's just that particular course would probably have a lot of travel associated right. with that. Sure. Okay, well, thank you again.
Um, and just a reminder to everybody, we'll be back in two weeks at 9 a.m. again. I believe that's the, uh, can, I, can I do math, uh, 22nd? Um, and that'll be Dean Janiak from here at the Smithsonian Marine Station uh, discussing the uh, Marine Geo, I believe, um, and what we do here under that program. So uh, we will see everybody in two weeks. Thanks again. Thank you.